Greetings, adventurers, and welcome back to the Den of the Drake. Other dragons hoard gold while I hoard internet cringe. Before we begin, I'd like to get a bit personal for a sec. Over the past few months, I've started... <laughs> Are we through? God, I hate his dumb voice. All right, everyone, sit down, shut up, and prepare your bodies because I'm throwing you in the trunk and taking you back to school. Oh, wait. Introductions, then threats of violence. Yeah, sorry about that. It's like a 50-50 chance that this mug is filled with coffee or bourbon on any given day. <laughs> My name is Happy, and welcome to the wonderful and wacky world of Happy Barra, a new YouTube channel from the talentless hack behind Den of the Drake. Here you'll take your seat in my class and we'll be exploring quirky subjects like zoology, paleontology, physics, astronomy, history, math. Actually, not math. Math sucks! And much, much more. So if you want to hear the world's largest rodent talk about the history of firearms, how the universe had to nerf the T-Rex by throwing a rock the size of Mount Everest at it, the amount of people who have been punched in the face by Teddy Roosevelt, or the science behind why you don't have an alien girlfriend, go subscribe to Happy Barra. The first episode is already up and ready for your viewing pleasure. It's about capybaras because of course it is. Class starts when I finish nursing this hangover, so don't be late. Link is in the description. And that's why stripping naked while coating yourself in olive oil in order to slide around on the floor pretending you're a banana slug is unfathomably based. But enough about me, let's get on to the topic of today's story. So we've all met those kinds of people who just keep pushing your buttons, only to get upset when one of the buttons they push happens to activate your backhand the annoying creep function. Evolution is funny, because it gives creatures the ability to learn from their mistakes in order to survive and reproduce, but it still keeps making people who think that cheating in D&D is a good idea. The saga I have for you today stars a cheating that guy, who thinks that they're so clever by picking up their own copy of the module their group is running only to throw man-child tantrum after man-child tantrum when the DM would dare suggest that he does not do that. Let me tell you, this is definitely a saga about someone who is just really not well adjusted to life as an adult. Now without any further delay, let's go ahead and dive right into the horrifying world of r slash RPG horror stories. Enjoy. This week's story comes from Reddit user Forlorn King. Part 1 is titled First Time DM Discovers Player Cheating. Player Rage Quits After the DM Tweaks Encounters. This post contains spoilers for Lost Mine of Fandelver. Got into the hobby a few years ago, no IRL friends, so I used Roll20 and LFG groups to find games. I had a few rough experiences as a player that should be posted here and ultimately decided to DM the 5e starter set for a group of randos myself. I posted the LFG with only the requirement being that players have neither read nor played through the starter set. The game starts off well enough. Everyone gets along, no one has played the starter set, players are all new to the game, and character creation goes well. The group consisted of me, the DM, a two-pack of friends who knew each other IRL, Adam and Barry, Rogue and Druid respectively, Deb, an awkward Canadian female, Monk, okay, OP, a, a Canadian woman, okay, it's not an animal, Canadian woman, thank you, and the cheater, Chris, who rolls a variant human paladin with polearm master feet at level one. Early on, it's clear Chris is trying to break the game. Instead of following the trail of goblin tracks to rescue their NPC employer, he pushes for them to go into town first. He doesn't take no for an answer, so the party continues to town to deliver the cart of goods. Town is beset by brigands, and NPCs express concern, since their employer was supposed to arrive in town a day ahead of the party. I'm trying to push them back on track without railroading them, but Chris wants to fight brigands instead. Encounter with bad guys goes as expected for a level 1 party. All but Chris gets dropped by multi-attacks. 
I had a plan that they would get captured should the TPK occur, but Chris uses Polearm Master plus Bless to one-shot the remaining bad guys. The group recovers and decides that they should go back and try to find their employer. The campaign proceeds, but I start to notice that Chris seems to know exactly what checks to make to avoid all the traps, he knows the shortcuts to the boss, etc, etc. He plays it off like they're lucky guesses, but his lucky guesses begin to border on clairvoyance. A couple weeks pass and Adam and Barry complain to me that the game feels like the Chris show. I talk to Chris and ask that he be conscious of how he's playing to allow others to do their thing. He apologizes to the group in the next session and passive aggressively states how he'll play his character less optimally so the other players can have their fun. Prick. Everyone else at the table starts having a lot of fun, except whenever the players are about to execute a plan that may trigger an ambush or a trap or be slightly less than a perfect playthrough, Chris would be like, mm, are you sure you want to do that? It's at this point that Chris's clairvoyance gets passed on to Deb, and also at this point where it's revealed that both Chris and Deb are now an item both in and out of game. At one point, Deb asks to look for secret doors, and to avoid metagaming after failed checks, I roll behind the screen. I tell her that while her search is thorough, it's just a normal wall. Now, this spot happens to be exactly where the leader of the hideout's secret escape route leads. Chris decides to leave a bear trap and some ball bearings there anyway. I start to suspect that Chris has read or is reading the published module to get ahead. To confirm my suspicions, I decide to tweak encounters. The game becomes a lot of work to prep, but it's fun to watch Chris get increasingly frustrated as he expends resources to avoid things that aren't there, and actually gets surprised by new stuff. This gets us to an encounter with a banshee. In the published module, the encounter is purely RP to avoid a TPK at level 3 with her whale. They have to flatter her to convince her to share information that they need. I tweaked it so they had to wait for the banshee to show up, with a trap in the form of a bejeweled jewelry case which is locked. Chris seems confused by the setup, and keeps saying, She should be here though. Adam and the rogue decide the temptation is too great and tries to pick the lock on the case. Success. They cheer. He opens it to reveal that it was a music box, with the effects of her wail inside, but only Adam can hear it. Adam fails and drops to zero. She shows up, pissed. They're extremely unlikely to get the info they need from her now. Adam is dying, so we roll initiative to follow a turn order during this mostly RP encounter. I explain to the party that she doesn't seem to want to fight, and seems embarrassed by her own appearance. I suggest that someone should stabilize Adam while others attempt to convince her to get the information. Chris is pissed and keeps saying, This isn't how it goes, over and over. I know for sure that he's been reading the module. His turn, I reminded him that Adam needs healing, and they're still there to convince her to give them info. Instead, he finally quits trying to play everything optimally and just tries to smite her. Everyone else playing groans at his decision. With his polearm master, smite, and some inspiration, he comes close to one-shotting the banshee at level 3. The banshee wails for real this time. No one saves. I have them roll death saves, which they all make, so they're just unconscious as a party in the banshee's den. The Banshee retreated in shame at her own wretched existence. Chris is livid. He goes off about how overpowered Banshees are and how that's why the writers of the module made it so she wouldn't use her whale. I said, how would you know about that without cheating? He disconnects right there. Sends me a message over Discord admitting that he had read the adventure module, but the game just wasn't for him and resigned. I wish I could say that this is where it ended, but two weeks later, Deb begged me to let him come back to apologize and keep playing. We were also having trouble finding a fourth player, and Adam and Barry just wanted to keep the game going. So, the saga continued. Okay, so one thing I appreciate here is that despite being fair to his players, the DM isn't babying them. So, I guess that might cancel out the use of the word females at the beginning, but that's still kinda cringe, not gonna lie. Anyway, back on topic. 
A banshee is a banshee, and it's one of the deadliest monsters a low-level party can face. Hell, even a mid-level party might struggle against one. So good on the DM for showing the potential lethality of the world that the characters inhabit without actually culling any of the characters. But onto the actual horror part of this horror story. I don't really like using modules because one, I like to use D&D to practice being a writer, and two, Wizards of the Coast will literally use your money to hire private military contractors to raid their consumers' homes, and three, you can easily get shit like this happening. I personally like to refer to this type of cheating as module sniping. Unlike other forms of D&D cheating, module snipers ruin the experience for everyone at the table 100% of the time. Because of the player's pre-existing knowledge of what is supposed to happen and when, literally nothing organic about the game survives. Part of the appeal of role-playing games is the ever-present threat of failure. Your character might die, the villain might get away, and worst of all, you might not get better prices on that magic item. But with the power of the module, a player always knows where to be, when to be there, and what to say. Dice rolls hardly even matter anymore because a smart player can engineer situations where a failed dice roll might not even result in the party actually failing. Sure, failing doesn't always feel good, but that's the price you pay for having victories that you can actually appreciate. Without the looming threat of failure, what do you really have? You have your seven layer velvet cake turned into a shitty hockey puck that got shot out of an easy bake oven, that's what you have. Part 2 is titled, First Time DM Catches Cheater by Tweaking Details of Published Module. Player Rage Quits. Again. Contains more Lost Minds of Vandelver spoilers. So Chris the Cheater came back to the game. Partially because Deb begged me and partially because we were having a hard time finding a fourth to play with us. I was desperate to not let my campaign fail, and I foolishly thought letting him back was the best option. Chris assured the group that he was no longer reading ahead and could only vaguely remember details of what was to come. I decided not to take his word for it and continued to tweak things, sometimes just by a little bit but more often by a lot. One of the reasons I ran the module was because I didn't have a ton of time to prep in my life. Countering his cheating meant more time prepping and DMing was gradually becoming more of a burden, but at the time I was really enjoying the creative outlet. The campaign continues. Chris is more careful, letting himself fail at things occasionally but whenever it really matters, he always miraculously knows exactly what's gonna happen next. The RP between Chris and Deb is getting weird too, but mostly just awkward and not inappropriate yet. Adam and Barry are bros and keep doing a great job keeping things light and fun while improving their RP skills a lot. The group had finally saved their employer and triumphantly made it back to town. It seemed that all was left was taking on the lost mine itself and the mysterious villain of the campaign, the Black Spider. In the first part, I mentioned how Chris pushed the party in the first session to go to Phandalin rather than following the clear clues of the goblin kidnapping. When it came out that he'd cheated, Chris sort of bragged one session that he had tried because when he read ahead, he thought the goblin cave was boring and wanted to see if he could skip it. The f this is where I made the biggest tweak to the adventure. When they got their NPC employer back in town, they were all met with distrust and derision rather than a hero's welcome. See, I had decided that as a consequence of Chris's fuckery at the beginning of the campaign, that the real Sildar had been killed due to their delay, and one of the Black Spider's doppelgangers took his place with the goal of one, investigating whether the player's employer had told anyone else the location of the mine, and two, consolidating the spider's hold on Vandalin by taking over as Sildar. This included poisoning the town against the adventures while they were out adventuring. Thus, they were met by an antagonistic new town master in Sildar, backed up by a militia that was a mix of former red brands and local townsfolk. The next couple of sessions, Chris was extraordinarily silent at the table. It was as if he utterly lacked all creativity now that we were completely off book. All he could suggest was murder hoboing his way through, 
When that didn't work, he tried to bully the group into leaving town straight for the mine despite Gundren himself saying that this was more important. The other three didn't bite. They investigated Sildren and learned that he was a fake. They made a deal with the Zents to run the remaining red brands out of town, which meant the Zents gained partial control of the town. They won the favor of the town by exposing Sildren as a fake. The session climaxed with fake Sildar taking a halfling kid NPC hostage and fleeing to a cave with a passage to the Underdark. Chris is bitching throughout, mostly because he wasted his smite slaying some mooks, and I wouldn't give them a long rest because they had to go save the kid. But then he said, This isn't right. The showdown with fake Sildar was rad. At first, fake Sildar pretended to be the kid, and they couldn't tell which one was real. Barry the Druid used his last spell slot on Moonbeam. Desperate, the fake Sildar grappled the kid and threatened to throw him into a seemingly bottomless pit if they didn't let him go. It's Chris's turn. He starts crying. Like, really ugly, fully grown-ass man crying. Awkward. He's so upset, yet totally paralyzed about what to do. He passes his turn. The party eventually decides to let the guy go save the kid. Session over. Adam and Barry are raving about how much fun the session was. Deb is hyped, too. That's when Chris goes off about how he feels like I'm f***ing with him now because he cheated way back then. He tells the group that the session triggered his anxiety because he didn't know what was going to happen next and begged me and the group to let the game get back on track. I was pretty shitty to him in response, calling him a bitch and suggesting that he should just quit if the game stressed him out that much. He disconnected. This was followed by a letter to the group about how hurt he was by my singling him out by changing the module and telling a whole long sob story about his life and how D&D is one of his few escapes and he needs it to feel in control of his shitty life. I was ready to write him off then and there, but no one wanted to play without him, and I was still too much of a pushover at that point in my life to not cut it off. So I let him come back, which is what led to part three, where the game finally came tumbling down. Oh yeah, not gonna lie champ, that's hella awkward. If I told a grown-ass man at my table not to cheat, and their response was just a breakdown crying, I don't even know what I'd do. I mean, OP's approach does come to mind, but the sympathetic part of me that I've tried to shove deep into a dark recess of my soul starts straining against its gag, you know? If someone's anxiety is so bad that they can't stand the thought of not knowing what happens next in a D&D game, that dude needs some f therapy. Babying people like this is only going to make things worse, to be perfectly honest. And yes, the sympathetic part of me really wants to feel bad for this guy, but the logical part knows that it's a load of shit. And I know I'm opening myself up for a load of comments to start screaming about how, uh, Drake, that's insensitive towards people suffering from anxiety. The fact of the matter is that it's not the responsibility of your D&D group to nurse your mental sickness. If the treatment you prescribed yourself to deal with your miswired brain is ruining the game for everyone else at a D&D &D table, you're kind of a dick. I feel like it's way too common for bad actors to lean on poor mental health to justify their actions. Your honor, my client didn't mean to distribute all of that crack, it was just his anxiety being triggered. Like I said earlier, the whole point of D&D is that you don't know what's gonna happen, and you can't really revert to a previous save like in a video game, which that one is fully understandable. When I selected to forcefully shove Dijkstra aside, I did not think that would translate into snapping his f***ing leg and letting the Psycho King Radovid win the war against Nilfgaard and go through with his mage genocide. <clears throat> Long story short, anxiety should be taken seriously, but it shouldn't be used as a get out of jail free card when it comes to being a prick which unfortunately sounds a lot like what's gonna happen in our third and final part of the story. Part three is titled Chris the Cheater and the Meltdown of Bryn Shander. So this post has spoilers for 5e starter set and a little bit for Storm King's Thunder. 
Chris rejoins after his sob story at the behest of the other players who just wanted to play D&D. All that's left is the secret mind that constitutes the finale. The party spends the first session preparing for the trip, and this is where I encounter the first red flag and the first signs that Chris didn't give a fuck and felt like his cheating was now condoned. As part of the prep, Chris makes a point of buying holy water. Because you never know when you might need this. Yes, you do, Chris. You know exactly what it's for. It was at this point, too, that Chris and Deb's characters hook up in-game. At the beginning of the campaign, I'd said that I didn't want to play through any explicit sexual stuff. And everyone agreed. But now they were role-playing their characters, admitting their love for each other, then started awkwardly narrating their resulting PDA. Chris says, I take her to our room in the inn and remove her monk robes. I cut it off and said, let's cut to black here. Your characters share a room at the inn and we can leave the rest to the imagination. Chris is miffed, as is Deb. Adam and Barry both remind them of what we all agreed on in session zero. I run the mine pretty much by the book because I didn't have a whole lot of free time for prep. And because Storm King's Thunder just came out and I had plans to transition from Lost Mine to that module while pretending like I was homebrewing. I figured the adventure would be too new for Chris to cheat and with an open enough sandbox to make his cheating not really matter anyway. In the mine, it becomes the Deb and Chris show. They both know exactly when and where the enemies are, where to look for loot, etc, etc. Adam and Barry are getting frustrated. They end up having to take a long rest inside the mine. The party locks down a room with some petons wedged under the doors. Good idea, Barry. On Chris's watch, he decides that he wants to narrate, Slipping into Deb's bedroll. <laughs> I tell him no. He keeps going. I throw a roaming pack of ghouls at them who barge through the door. Chris is mad because, presumably Deb's passive perception should have been high enough to have heard them coming. Not when she's occupied with you trying to slip it in, dude. At the end of the day, with no resources, it's a tough fight, and Deb goes down and fails two death saves before they can help. The couple is mad because I'd interrupted virtual tabletop sexy times. Barry is mad because his really good idea of locking down the room didn't work. The only other highlight from the mine was the flame skull. Remember the holy water that Chris bought? Well, it was for this. It was a tough fight, and Chris wanted to avoid it altogether. But Adam and Barry would sometimes face roll a room just to fuck with Chris. They made it through when Chris dumped the holy water on the flame skull's remains. Just in case. My eyes rolled out of my head at that point, but I was going to bear it until Storm King's Thunder. The starter set ends and they get some downtime. Squad is level 5, so we're starting chapter 3 of Storm King's Thunder. Storm King's Thunder has three ways to run the initial call to action encounter. Each one puts the players in a different town on the Sword Coast, and the encounters are very different. I don't tell them we're running the module, I just give them a quest to get their asses up to a city in the north called Bryn Shander. I'm prepping the Bryn Shander encounter and see Chris and Deb are logged into the game in roll 20. They keep making rolls while I'm trying to prep, so I jump into the Discord to ask them to clear out for a bit or to see if they need help with something. They were acting out the scenes that I wouldn't let them have. They didn't notice me enter the chat, so I had to clear my throat and they both just disconnected. I sent them both messages that whatever they do on their own time is whatever but that they needed to use a personal voice chat for that. No response. The party makes their way to Bryn Shander. With random encounters, Chris doesn't have much to work with, but he was damn sure to know exactly what the H enemy's weaknesses were as well as their HP, second guessing my math when he'd expected the enemy to be bloodied. The encounter in Bryn Shander consists of a massive ice giant attack. The players take control of NPCs around town in addition to their characters. If the NPCs survive, they will be rewarded with a quest from that NPC. The group had met some of these NPCs already, but this encounter was how I was introducing others to the party. I drew a giant non-contiguous map of the sections of the town to scale down three or four separate encounters across the city, 
and gave NPC stat blocks to each player. Chris insisted on a particular NPC, which was a red flag that I maybe hadn't been crafty enough pretending like I was homebrewing. Like he really wanted that NPC's quest in particular. I don't even remember what it was at the time, but it stood out as an indication that my attempt to shake his cheating had failed. Either way, the battle ensues, and Chris is trying to keep his NPC out of danger. But the encounters were set up to be dangerous. A giant boulder hits the NPC Chris, and he goes down. No one around has healing, and all the medicine checks to stabilize fail. Adam's NPC dies too, but they win the battle and drive off the giants. Chris is clearly upset that his NPC died. He tries to argue that he should be able to bring the NPC back, etc, etc. I tell him them's the breaks. No resurrection, no retcons. He then has the balls to complain about my choice of town for the first attack. He had apparently read the new adventure module and was hoping that I would take them to one of the other towns to start the module instead. Specifically Tribor, because it was more interesting. I call him a piece of shit cheater and ask that he leaves the game. He says he quits because I wouldn't give him enough RP time with Deb. He and Deb disconnect. Chris then proceeds to leave me a message the next day, cataloging all his beefs with my DM style and how I needed to find a new hobby. Adam and Barry aren't mad at the cheating because, after all, even with the cheating we almost died a bunch of times. They still resigned from the game because they didn't feel like finding two new players and wanted it to end at the starter set in the first place. So just like that, the game fizzled out. This story does have a happy ending. I took about a year off of DMing after that and then found a new group to DM through Tomb of Annihilation. We played every week for a year straight, and they got through the whole thing. It was epic and fun and super rewarding. Fuck you, Chris. End of story. Wow, OP got weirdly aggressive towards the end there. Maybe it wasn't just Chris's cheating that caused the other two players to dip. Eh, maybe a little column A and a little column B. I don't blame OP for being frustrated, though. Throw in being a creepy sex pest on top of being a serial cheater, and you got a DM nightmare to deal with. Bro, imagine getting upset that the DM won't help you hold the party hostage just so you and your girlfriend can roleplay sexy time in front of them. I've always been a big advocate for the fade to black method, but for the love of god, it takes a special kind of person to respond to, and the scene fades to black with, uh, dick move, dude. Maybe he should have bought the module on how not to be a maladjusted weirdo and read the page about how people don't appreciate having to sit through a narrated rendition of Fifty Shades of Chris. Now that's one form of cheating that I know I can get behind. And on that note, let's take a look at this week's Gallery of the Drake. This week's fan art comes from viewer Smag the Smug, which depicts two of the Great Devourer's most terrifying bioforms. As I'm sure most of you know at this point, I'm a pretty big 40k fan. So let me tell you, this fan art put a huge smile on my face when it showed up in my inbox. Greetings, rogue traders, and welcome back to the nest of the tyrant. Other tyranids devour biomass, while I devour internet cringe. <sighs> Thank you again, Smag the Smug, for submitting your art. If you'd like to see your fan art featured in Gallery of the Drake, be sure to send it to the email in my About section. Fan art is my favorite part of doing YouTube, and it means the world to me that I can inspire artists like you to create artwork like this. With the story over and artwork displayed, we're gonna go ahead and wrap up. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And if you feel like supporting the channel further, Patreon and merchandise links are in the description. I would like to thank you all for listening, and I hope to see you next time in the Den of the Drake. Go subscribe to Happy Bara! I spent like eight months on that shit.